Welcome back everyone to ABG Investor Days. My name is Henrik Inse and I'm an equity research analyst here at ABG. With me now I have a company called Freemelt, which is one I cover. Uh, and presenting for us today will be Daniel Jidlund, the CEO of Freemelt, and Ulrik Jungblad, the CIO of Freemelt. Please take it away. Okay, thank you Henrik. So, welcome to, to Freemelt. Uh, uh, Freemelt is uh, a deep tech and a green tech company, and we will uh, take you through uh, for, for the next 20 minutes. So, uh, if we start with uh, the type of 3D printing that we are in, we're in metal 3D printing, and we are in, in pow uh, powder bed fusion, and uh, Ulf will come back a bit later on that as well. The business potential only for, for this type of technology is, is for, for the next uh, couple of years around 30 billion sex. So at 2026, it's expected to be around uh, 30 billion. Uh, it will be a good growth over the next couple of years as well. We have a CAGR of uh, roughly 28%. Uh, 3D printing as such, I think maybe most of you think about prototyping and that has been the focus as well for 3D printing for, for quite some time. But now the technology and also the, the customer is, is more mature, so now we go more into a production focus. And if we also uh, continue the, the other kind of benefits when it comes to 3D printing, uh, that's of course about also that, you know, here we can produce new and more complex components that you cannot do with uh, other kind of technology. Uh, we can also develop new type of materials uh, and composition of materials that is, is also impossible uh, through other technologies as well. So in a nutshell, what 3D printing brings, I mean, that's uh, we get better products, we get lighter products, less waste of the, uh, the products and also stronger products than made than in traditional ways. And then I think also the, uh, the last point is also quite important and especially I think during uh, when we have seen supply constraints around the world as well you can also build a much more uh, efficient manufacturing footprint as well and to really produce your products much closer to the end user as well which means that you reduce cost for freight and transportation time and of course also the CO2 uh, emission as well. Uh, Freemelt started uh, in 2017 um, and uh, pretty much it, on the day, I would say, two years after the, the company was uh, founded, uh, we delivered the first machine. Um, we are a public listed company on the uh, Nasdaq First uh, North and had an IPO in 2021. So far we have raised 188 million through uh, issues of shares. And we have currently 35 employees, uh, mainly in Sweden and mainly in Gothenburg, uh, where we have the, the headquarter. Um, we have, uh, except for Gothenburg, we're in Linköping as well, where we have the production site. And we have a sales office in Germany and actually uh, starting up one in the US as we, we speak. Uh, 2022 was really the, the breakthrough from a commercial perspective, I would say. We had eight new orders uh, uh, last year and we delivered nine machines. And uh, even within the short time period, we have actually sold 19 systems a uh, year to date. And this has actually taken us to the number two position globally in this specific uh, uh, type of technology. Um, we have been... Uh, uh, when we presented Freeman to uh, investors, a lot of them has mentioned about Arkham. Arkham uh, was a, a great success in, Sw in Sweden in, uh, from 97 on up to 2016 when GE acquired them. So that's why we also have a, a peer benchmark just to, to see how their development uh, were. Uh, versus Freeman. So on the green uh, line you can see the start in 2017 of Freeman, then 97 for Arkham, and if I put it at the, the, the year of the hockey stick when it really took off sales-wise was last year for us, so year six, and for Arkham is uh, pretty much in year 10. Ulrik. Yes, so I, I will talk a bit about our technology that we use in the in the systems that we produce. So it's electron beam powder bed fusion, which uh, is the best uh, suitable technology within the 3D printing field, in our view, on uh, when it comes to productivity. A lot of that has to do with the high beam power that we use uh, for printing. So we focus on applications that are suitable for this technology, and uh, it differs quite a lot from our other competitors within this field in the way that we use 
uh, technology that uh, works at a very highly elevated temperature for the workpiece that we produce. So it's uh, uh, for some materials it's up to 1000 degrees centigrade and even further. That means that we can do things uh, when it comes to materials in the technology that can't be done any other way. So we can tailor material properties in that way. Uh, it's also especially good for bulky parts. And we also focus on small to medium size parts, which is actually the, uh, the most parts out there in the world that are produced. They are small to medium size, and it's also most suited for this technology. Uh, in the build chamber, we, we use a vacuum technology. So inside the vacuum, it's a harsh environment with evaporation when they melt uh, the, the powder and, and also at the high temperature, as we said. So we use a high resolution electron beam with high beam power and that enables very high productivity. So we are aiming to compete with traditional manufacturing methods like casting, forging, machining and so on. Uh, and also we use a, with electrons, we can move the beam very fast to new positions. And that means that we can uh, we can also print fast because of that. So we use this technology in our products and uh, the, the product that we have on the market is Fremont One. This is a state-of-the-art machine for material development. Uh, it's an open source electron beam powered by fusion system uh, for use in materials development. And we have, as Daniel said, sold this to a number of universities, but also industrial users uh, for material uh, research. The next step for us is the email system. It's a production system for high volume production. It's an uh, industrial open source electron beam powered bed fusion system. And it's also based on the same core technology as Fremont One. And what's important here is that material processes that are developed in Fremont One can be directly transferred into email. And that cuts a lot of time when it comes to uh, applying this technology for new mass production uh, cases. We also have a software called Pixel Melt. So it's specially made to, for data preparation into our systems and, and make use of the fact that we can move the beam very quickly from place to place. So we can actually reposition the beam for melting in more than tens of thousands of places every second. That is very different from all our competitors and it enables uh, new materials and new ways of uh, producing parts in an efficient way. We have also adopted from the start open source uh, strategy where we enable our customers to use the technology fully by allowing them access to the software itself. That means that they are also able to create their own IP, which is a big advantage for, for our customers. Uh, my background is actually it, it's a commercial background, but also I spent my whole career with an aftermarket. So uh, that's also why uh, aftermarket now we are bringing that as uh, really close to our strategy as well. I've seen the value both from a customer side. I mean the value that you you can bring, but of course also when you're building a sustainable, profitable uh, business as well, it's absolutely crucial. So we we uh, definitely take that into uh, consideration now as well. And of course this will also reduce our transaction exposure you know, to, from a price perspective and we can focus more on the, the value side of it. Uh, we're just starting now and this is especially for the industrial machine, uh, not uh, so much or as much for, for the research machine but mainly for the in industry which of course it's crucial to have a machine up and running and producing. So we're defining a life cycle strategy as we speak and now email which we are finalizing the development of here it's crucial also to design also that machine from an aftermarket perspective. Uh, digitalization, I think all of you have heard about. The data is, of course, very important. And it's, uh, it, it's a huge value when you can start to interpret data and, and translate it into values for the customers from an uptime perspective, from a productivity point of view. So this is why we foresee as well to have reliability centers 24-7 uh, uh, supporting our customers as well. And in the end, uh, the kind of conversations we have with some of the industrial partners is that instead of buying a system, they are asking also if it's possible to buy like a performance contract as well. So that's also something that we are considering as well moving forward. 
we work. Uh, we have defined four uh, business verticals uh, and three uh, core materials that we're working with. The first one, which is about research, uh, uh, here is independent on materials. So this is the customer can really uh, work with any kind of materials. Uh, this is a this is a big uh, business vertical. We talk a lot about the the industrial side, but actually this one is is really big. We have 30,000 universities and uh, AM Power, which is a consultancy firm. They their estimation is that there will be 900 new machines in this type of technology we're talking about that will be sold by 2026. And here, as Ulrich mentioned, I mean, open source is, is a, a critical decision point for, for those customers. If we go then to, to the uh, right the side of the, the slide here, then titanium is one of the prioritized uh, materials, and we have defined pretty much implants as the application that we're going to focus on. Uh, it's also a lot of based on the history that Ulrich and the team has here as well. Uh, uh, and I would claim that this uh, application is one of the more mature also. And then maybe 4% seems a bit low, uh, but the, the point is that um, so 4% is, is the, the current ratio of all the, the produced plants uh, uh, in the industry. But you can see it's an, it's an expectation now to start to grow substantially up to 20%. And here, um, uh, AM Power uh, expect it to be roughly 700 new machines sold for this application by 2026. And uh, to make sure now that we develop a product that also the market expect, we work closely uh, with a few industrial partners in this specific application to make sure that the email meet the, the expectations as well. The third or the second one material is tungsten. Um, tungsten has literally exploded, I would say, um, in, in regards to interest over the last couple of months. Uh, Fusion, uh, for instance, uh, is one of the applications. Medtech is another, and we put other as well because it it's popping up new applications for in tungsten uh, on a regular basis. We just took one example here to show you about the potential of, of this uh, market potential, and this is for fusion. So this is what Commonwealth Fusion System uh, claim as their vision that by 2050, 20% uh, of the world uh, energy production should be through fusion. And if that is the case, then you know it would be in need of tens of thousands of printers. And why? Uh, because if this is how, uh, one of the reactor design looks like, and the, the, the whole encapsulation of the uh, reactor is in tungsten, because that's pretty much the only material that can uh, stand the high temperatures within the reactor. And so even for, re for research perspe uh, perspective, I mean, it's still a huge business potential uh, in that segment. And same kind of thing here as well. We work closely with uh, industrial partners on, on, on this as well. Then on the, uh, and I should say as well, it, it's roughly 50,000 to 100,000 parts inside. So it, it's a lot of them. And of course, this is a consumable. Uh, so you need to replace this on, on a regular basis. On copper, which is our fourth uh, uh, focus material, here uh, it's mainly in electromobility and mainly in connectivity. And here our technology also is highly you know, beneficial because it's in vacuum, which is, is uh, perfect for high purity parts as well. Okay, and uh, so this uh, slide is about our competition and the landscape of uh, producers of systems for electron beam powered belt fusion. But first to the left is an assessment by, by this uh, market investigation company, AIM Power, <coughs> on all the different uh, additive manufacturing technologies, uh, how mature they are. Uh, for metal manufacturing. And as you can see, uh, laser powered bed fusion is way in the lead. It's widespread industrial use. There's a lot of printers sold. Uh, but actually, e electron beam powered bed fusion is in the industrial sector already. And of course, we aim to bring this up to where laser powered bed fusion is by uh, implementing this in the different material uh, verticals that we saw on the previous slide. And from our competitors on the right, uh, General Electric that bought Arkham has by far, by far the, the most installed printers when it comes to electron beam powered by fusion, used mainly for 
uh, aerospace application and, and for implant uh, applications, but also a lot of research. <coughs> so we are by far number two in this. We have now installed 17 systems, uh, uh, nine last year. So we are way ahead of the other competitors that are entering into this, uh, into this area where there are scattered sales with some of these uh, upcoming competitors to us, but we are far in the lead. And the positive is that it also increases uh, from a competition side uh, on a regular basis now, which I think is good for, for the industry as such. If we zoom in on financials, and last year, as I mentioned before, was uh, a really good year. It was a record year in sales. Uh, we had net sales of 36 million. Uh, we had eight orders and nine systems delivered. Uh, we have a very strong sales penetration in US. US is a very important market when it comes to research. Uh, US as such is investing heavily in research and actually a lot connected to the, the materials that, that we uh, are focused on as well. Um, we also launched our industrial machine EMELT, uh, which of course was a key milestone for us. Now uh, the aim is really to, to get into production uh, at a few customer size by, by the end of this uh, year as well. And then maybe just to highlight, I think you know, people is of course important when, uh, when you are uh, doing business. And we managed to get Dr. Johannes Schleifenbaum into as a board member. And he's, uh, he's a professor at Aachen University, uh, which is really the mecca for 3D printing as well. Our focus now forward here, uh, we just announced uh, in February about UK AEA. That has reached out to, to us to get the help to develop uh, uh, 3D printed parts in tungsten for development of fusion reactors. And of course, I mean, when uh, we feel very proud when some uh, authority in, in the UK is reaching out to a small company in Sweden in, in, in Gothenburg. Uh, but I think it tells about we have a good reputation in, in material process development. We also just finalized an issue of shares of 66 million, which uh, makes us now really to, to step up in the email uh, uh, development and uh, complete uh, that uh, uh, industrialization part. We are continue to ramp up in sales and service. I mean, the research machine that we have in place and we have a good traction now in, in North America and Europe, we need to invest in more resources so we can grow organically as well. Uh, we also not slightly changed the structure of the organization to become you know, uh, quicker, more agile and be closer to our customers. So we will have a regional execution structure. And we're starting with North America uh, as of this week. We'll go to EMEA and then APAC as well. And then our long-term view and ambition is that we would like to become the number one uh, in this specific area uh, for the, the decided applications of tungsten, implants, and copper and research as well. So from our perspective, I think it's, uh, we think it's a, uh, it's a perfect opportunity now uh, where we are. We have a, uh, a good product, we have a good uh, traction on, on the research uh, side. It's still a, a huge uh, a growth in, in this uh, industry. And the other part as well that we also do only business in, in high value verticals. So it's not the price sensitive uh, kind of uh, business vertical. Together with our focus on aftermarket, I think we will also uh, try to uh, make sure to maintain the good profitability um, and margins uh, moving forward as well. Uh, and yeah, as, as we uh, Ulrik mentioned as well, uh, the position we have now to, to really scale up and to have a high ramp up efficiency, I think the likelihood for, for that is, is also uh, very good as well. So that's all from our side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, Daniel and Ulrik. Let's move on to some questions. So 2022 was the year uh, where sales really kicked off uh, in the company. Could you talk a bit about the outlook for 2023? Sure. <clears throat> uh, I think, uh, as, as I mentioned before, I mean, uh, US, uh, we had a really good uh, penetration at the end of, of last year. And um, uh, so far, um, you know, the, the type of cu uh, these customers, mainly universities, 
uh, they are really keen to, to get the open source. Um, and also, I mean, so far, customers talk to customers. So I think uh, from, from a sales acceleration point of view, we expect to really continue to uh, grow uh, a lot in sales for, for the research. When it comes to email and the industrial machine, that will not take place, as I said, until end of, of this year. So, so the, the main development sales in this year will be about the research machine, which we are you know, very positive around as well. Mm. And uh, speaking of the email, could you maybe expand a bit on how you've been working to prepare the market for, uh, for this machine and uh, how the rollout will look once you are done with development? Awesome. Yeah, so we've been throughout the project. We've been working very close with, like Daniel said, a few uh, partners, a few becoming customers, where they have had the chance to influence the design of the system. And we are also working very close, especially on the material development side, where we now develop material processes for email in our own FreeMelt One systems. So this we do very integrated with our customers uh, and according to their specifications. Uh, but also, uh, we are preparing now for the, uh, for the launch of the first systems into, into these customers as well. All right. So, in a long-term perspective, you talked a bit about more of a service business as well. Could you uh, maybe tell us a bit more about that? What do you think the potential is there? Currently, you're only or mostly selling machines. What do you think the potential is there for a service-based business going forward? Oh, <clears throat> I think it's it, it's a very difficult question. I'm not sure if I can uh, give you a clear answer on that one. But uh, uh, for from a research perspective, uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, a big uh, business. But when it comes to the industrial machine. Um, and the here, what we can see, it's um, in most of the, the applications, it will be a 24/7 uh, operation where those machines going to uh, be as well. Then, of course, I mean the importance of aftermarket is crucial. So there, I definitely foresee that those customers, and even as Ulrich mentioned, uh, these customers already now start to to uh, have that, that kind of conversation. I mean, uh, instead of uh, buying from a CapEx point of view, is it possible to buy more from perform, uh, performance type of contracts? If that really goes ahead, then of course, I mean, the, uh, I would say the, big, the biggest portion of our business in the future will actually be on the services side. With that said, uh, I'm, I'm coming from, from a mining industry where uh, it's, it's quite common to have these kind of contracts, supplier customers, and it's also a big risk. So when the technology is new, we will not step into this until uh, I would say a few years when the technology is more mature, we have a better relationship with our customers and so forth, but then for sure we're going to try to go that direction. So. Mm. Interesting. Um, you mentioned this uh, <coughs> contract with the United Kingdom Energy Authority or something, which is sort of a research contract. Uh, is, is that something you, you plan to do more of or how did that happen? For sure. Uh, I think uh, maybe you would like to answer, Rick. Yes, I, I could answer that. It's uh, uh, yeah, so it's a research uh, contract. They are paying us to develop uh, uh, tungsten uh, towards their needs. So there's a lot of uh, requirements when it when it when it comes to using tungsten in. Uh, uh, infusion. It's not only the heat resistance, it's also radiation resistance. It's, it's about lifetime because it, it is, like you say, um, consumable. So um, a lot of material uh, pro uh, properties are very important there. So this is a research project that, that we have sold to them and that we will deliver on. But yes, we are also uh, going to do this going forward in other areas. In in our main vertical, so in the implant side on the uh, different fusion applications, but also on, on copper. And, and also I can just add as well, of course, uh, uh, this type of uh, focus is not just in the UK. I mean, I think yeah. all continents are spending a lot of investment in this area. So if we are successful here, I'm pretty sure we will get uh, hopefully uh, interest from other uh, countries moving forward as well. Thank you very much for that. I think that's uh, all we have time for today. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.